evening, friends, and welcome back to Professor Pastor Paul's Midweek Bible Festival. It's nice to be with you all. I hope you're having a good week. I hope you're uh, pulling through, continuing to pull through this strange and difficult time. And I'm going to speak to that tonight, to this strange and difficult time we find ourselves in. And we're going to start where we picked up last week. We're going to return to that epic journey of Moses and the Israelites out of Egypt and through the wilderness. Our passage this week from the lectionary comes from the 17th chapter of Exodus. Exodus 17 verses 1 through 7. Hear the word of God. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water <clears throat> for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Mar Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? That's a question, isn't it? Is the Lord among us or not? So we continue, as I have said this week, with Israel's epic journey out of Egypt. To recap, Moses has heard a call from the Lord, a call to lead his people from slavery up into a good and broad land, and is doing his dead-level best to follow through with that. So far, our hero and his entourage have survived the night of death in Egypt. They have walked straight out of bondage in broad daylight in front of Pharaoh and everybody, have crossed over the dry floor of the Red Sea, have followed pillars of cloud and fire across the desert, have received manna and quail from the hand of the Lord, and have left the wilderness of sin, or zen, and arrived by stages at Rufidim, a location believed to be near the Wadi Faran, Sinai's largest and widest Wadi. But the Wadi is dry. The rainy season, it seems, had passed. Now this is a great place to remind you that throughout this epic adventure, the Israelites have moaned and complained and carried on to their leadership, mostly Moses, and the dry wadi gives them a fresh opportunity to vent their opinions. And parenthetically, I might say that you might think that these miracles, the mosey out of Egypt, mosey, I'm sure that's a good word for it, the mosey out of Egypt, the dividing of the Red Sea, the cloud and the fire, and the timely delivery of manna and quail might be enough to settle the Israelites down and help them remember who they are following. The Lord, not Moses. And that you might think that through all of this, they might have come to trust the process. If not the Lord, at least the process. But no, they have not. They turn to Moses and sound off. Give us water to drink, they say. Last week they were hungry and demanded food. This week they're thirsty 
and they demand water. And Moses replies, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? We see here another cycle of an established pattern. The Lord blamed Moses, that is human leadership, but Moses again points to God and asks them, why do you test the Lord? The good-natured optimist in me says that Moses possesses a deep and unshakable faith, that he knows without the sh a trace of a doubt that they are on the right track, that the Lord is in fact always with them and always leading them, and that it really makes no sense for people to complain about Moses himself when he is only carrying out the Lord's clear wishes for everybody. My darker-edged cynic says that, like all leaders, Moses is covering his butt. Pardon the language. I thought of, I spent five minutes trying to come up with a better term for that, but there is none. Like all leaders, Moses is covering his butt. That's the cynic in me. It is the Lord, not I, he claims, who has brought us here. Not me, the Lord. So please give me a break and take your problem to Yahweh. Thereby... He shuffles the buck down the hall to God's office. Moses may be Moses, but he's also very human. A third option is that Moses is tired of having to negotiate with God for another blessed sign. Right? The Lord has offered sign upon sign, but this has not helped the people to believe and trust. Why would another sign make any difference? This is probably what Moses means when he says, why do you test the Lord? Uh, I can't remember the context, but it kind of remembers, it kind of recalls to me that thing that Jesus said when he said, only a wicked and adulterous generation seeks a sign. In any case, the people aren't listening. They, they, Moses moves his mouth, the words come out, but the people just goes right past them right past him. They're not listening. They keep the focus on Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Why, did you, why are you trying to kill us and our children and, this time, our livestock with thirst? Moses is backed into a corner yet again, and he turns to the only one that he can turn to, which is Yahweh. What shall I do with this people, he asks. They are almost ready to stone me. Now the Lord hears Moses and gives an unexpected reply. Go, pack your stuff. I'm sorry, your staff. <laughs> yeah, God didn't say pack your stuff, although Moses probably did that. He said pack your staff, take your staff. You know, the same one you used to turn the Nile to blood back there in Egypt and take some elders to Horeb and strike the rock with your staff. And the Lord closes, closes out the instructions by ensuring that in doing this, these things, Moses will solve the water problem. The Lord says water will come out of the rock so that the people may drink. Okay, sounds like a good plan. So Moses follows God's instructions and sure enough, you know, he gets his elders together, he packs his stuff and his staff, they head out to Horeb, they find the rock, I guess that everybody knows where the rock is because he found it, and he struck the rock in the sight of the elders and water gushes out of the rock. And Moses's and the people's problem, at least the immediate problem, is solved. But of course there is more happening here than the simple solution to a thirst problem. The first is this, of all things, it is the people's bickering and complaining and anxiety and worry and fear that finally brings them to Mount Horeb, which, as we have stated on several previous occasions, is also known as Mount Sinai. Whether or not the people know it, it is precisely to Horeb that Moses has been leading them all along, perhaps knowing that God would be there. 
but it is their whining. That's the word David will use this Sunday. It is their whining that leads them to the very place that they will not only find water, but they will be given the law and they will be consecrated as a people. A little bit of irony there. Now Moses has, of course, been to Horeb before. This is the place to which he ran after he murdered the Egyptian and as he sought to remove himself from the consequences of his crime. Here again, as it was now, as it, was, as it is now, as it was, it was before. It, it was through dark and trouble that Moses found his way to God both times. At Horeb, the Lord appeared to Moses in the burning bush and started this whole thing off. The call of Moses. And at Horeb, Moses and therefore the people received the name of God, Yahweh. I don't know what Moses expects to happen in this place this time with all the people, but water in a dry land is as good a sign of God's presence as anything I can think of. Water in a dry land. At Sinai, deep in the wilderness, the wall between the holy and the mundane draws very thin once more. At Sinai, God shows up once more. The Desert Fathers were a group of Christians who, as the faith became associated with the decadence and the violence and the political and military power of the Roman Empire, as Christianity became the official religion, this group of individuals, fathers and mothers really, retreated to the wilderness to sustain the faith's humble and vital identity, thinking that mixing faith with religion, I mean religion with politics, didn't work then and it doesn't work now. They thought they would retreat to the desert and they were an important group in Christian history. Trappist monk Thomas Merton wrote of them, The Desert Fathers believed that the wilderness had been created supremely valuable in the eyes of God. The wilderness was supremely valuable in the eyes of God precisely because it had no value to men. The wasteland, the wilderness, was the land that could never be wasted by men because it offered them nothing. There was nothing to attract them. There was nothing to exploit. And indeed, it is in the wilderness that, uh, yet again, that God is most clearly manifested and most readily encountered. In the absence of all props, in the absence of all pretending, that's where God shows up, in the wilderness. When Yahweh told Moses to take the elders and go to the wilderness of Horeb, he was promised not only water, but the very presence of God. The Lord said to Moses, I will, when you go to the rock at Horeb, I will be standing there in front of you on the rock. I will be there in front of you. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. The wilderness captures our imaginations because we so precisely because we so often find ourselves in the midst of it. As you can see, I'm coming to you from Carriker Hall, a place so quiet and so empty for so many weeks. We are in the wilderness, friends, as a community and as individuals, some of us further out and more isolated than others. And it doesn't really matter exactly how we got here, just as it didn't matter what precisely brought the Israelites to the wilderness of Sinai that day. What's true and what remains is that we, like them, are being called to a good and a broad land. We, like them, must pass through the wilderness to get there. And friends, here we are. We, like them, find ourselves sometimes at a loss hungry, alone, worried, anxious, and fearful. But today's story tells us 
that even in the deep wilderness, it is sometimes even our fears that can drive us to the place where water flows and where God stands ready to be known and to provide for us and to comfort us there in the heart of the wilderness. The place where Moses drew water from the rock he called with a fine dash of irony, Massa and Meribah, which means test and quarrel, test and quarrel. Are we here in the age of COVID being tested? I don't know, but it sure feels like it. Are we here in the age of polarized everything, quarreling? Oh yes, to be sure, all the time, nonstop. We too find ourselves in the land of test and quarrel. Today, here in Decatur, Georgia, we are squarely in the middle of the land of test and quarrel. But this week, at least, be assured that, that water may be found even here. And the Lord is present, Yahweh is present, even here with us and in such a place as this. God be with all of you. Love you all. Miss you all. One day we'll meet again. Hopefully, it won't be too long. Amen. <laughs>